And we'll turn with me to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 20. Now, <clears throat> I want to say uh, happy Father's Day to all of you fathers. And, and I can't overstate the importance of Christian dads in this world. It can't be overstated. I know that we say the same thing and have, and we mean it when we can't overstate the importance of Christian mothers and the dedication that they have. But dads are a little different from the mothers <clears throat> because you have a directive that comes directly from God himself, as a believing dad, you have a directive to be the spiritual leader of your household. That is biblical. That is scripture. That means it's not because some preacher somewhere said it or some prophet somewhere said it or some man other than that somewhere said it. It meant God said it. And when God said it, that sealed it, all right? And so you have a huge responsibility as a father. And I don't care how old your children get. I don't care if your children are grown. I don't care if they're grown and they have grandchildren and whatever it may be. I don't care. It never changes. You are still that spiritual guidance within your family. And that's the way God directed it to be. So that's why I say we can't overstate the importance of Christian names. So most of the time when we think about Father's Day messages that are brought, you're going to find where people are going to go into the book of Ephesians where Paul gave directive to both parents. Right at the beginning of chapter 6, and he ends it with 5 and starts to go into how we should live as believers, how parents should act. I even have <clears throat> know that, that lots of preachers will go into the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and they will use the verses there, especially with the Fifth Commandment where we're talking about how you should honor your father and your mother and how that's different from every other commandment. You know what makes it different from every other commandment? It is the commandment that has a promise that goes along with it. If you do it, there's something good that'll happen. If you honor your mother and your father, then your days will be long and prosperous upon the earth. It's the only commandment with promise. Right? And that's how important it is. That's how important it is to be a Christian believing parent. The emphasis that you have upon your family. Those are the things that are extremely, extremely important. That's why we can't overstate the importance of good Christian dads who are spiritual leaders and the importance of good Christian mothers who are the keepers of the home. That doesn't mean that you're running around cleaning up behind everybody, sweeping the floors, back the floors, making sure everything's done. That's not what that means. What that means is you are the rock that holds the family together. All right? You are the, the, the women are the ones that make everything work and fit together as a family. That's why your job is different from the dad's job, but is as equally important as him being the spiritual leader because you are the glue that makes everything hold together, stick together. You are the piece that makes everything fit in this puzzle of life. It is extremely important. So you can't overstate the importance of that. 
And so when we go to these, we think about these scriptures. You probably wouldn't think about coming here. And I really don't know why the Lord laid this on my heart. But when, when I was reading this, there were so many things that stuck out to me in these few verses that we're going to read that not only apply to fathers, because they will, and they not only apply to mothers, because they will, but it's going to apply to every believer in the world because the same things that God expects out of fathers, the same thing that God expects out of mothers, are the same things that God expects out of the children. He expects us to be obedient, to listen to his word, to listen to what he's told us and what he directs us, and let us live the life. And it doesn't matter doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, doesn't matter how old your children are, doesn't matter how young they are. What matters is how we live our lives to develop a stronger relationship with Jesus Christ so that we can have good standing with Jesus Christ, so that we can be the example to the world that we should be, so we can therefore spread the gospel as he would have us to. So I want to start reading in Proverbs 20, verse number 3. Proverbs 20, verse number 3. He said, It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Okay? Now, let's stop here. I was going to read these verses and tie them all together. But we'll stop at each verse because we find something important in each verse. So we'll just do it that way. <clears throat> so what we find here is what God expects out of us is the opposite of what we read here. Okay? Now, what we want, we see that a good man is one that goes away and he is an honorable person because he goes away from the anger to strife. And here, the word meddling is another one of those terms where it's talking about people who cause problems or intensify the anger or the strife or the wrath or the vengeance that's already there. All right? He said that's what a fool does. A fool makes the matter worse by egging it on. Or by standing there saying, yeah, this even makes me matter. Focusing on those things. So here's the point. <clears throat> what does God expect us to be? Patient. Patient. What does it say that tribulation works in the book of James? Patience. What do we also see when we're talking about it in the book of Romans? Patience. Tribulation works as patience. And then you go on down through there in Romans where it says tribulation works patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope makes us not ashamed. And you know where it all started? With problems. So what do we have to be? One of the hardest things in the world for any of us to be and something that we attribute to Job all the time, we have to be people of patience. A truly good Christian father is a patient person. You know, <clears throat> we think about a dog when it growls. And the dog, when it growls and it shows its teeth, and it makes you a little nervous and you stop. If you walk up on a dog that you don't know and that dog starts growling at you and you start seeing those teeth, you usually stop to assess the situation for a minute, right? You don't just go piling up to the dog. Why? Because you might get bit. You don't know if that's a biting dog or just a growling dog. So what God teaches us is in this is that for those of us who are trying to serve the Lord, and if even if we're trying to raise children, or even after the children are grown, what we have to learn is that it's not always good to go around growling, showing your teeth. 
What we have to learn is patience. What we should be doing in these terms of helping others is quoting Scripture. This is what God said for us to do in these situations. This is what God says should happen here. This is according to the Scriptures. This is exactly the way that God wants us to do. Well, the only way that you're going to be able to quote scriptures to your children or to your grandchildren or to your great-grandchildren, the only way you're ever going to be able to do that is to know the Word of God. Which means you have to study the Word of God. You have to be able to apply the Word of God. We have to learn to be patient. Patient doesn't always mean just waiting on the Lord to answer a prayer. We have to be patient in times of trouble, putting our faith in Christ, knowing that he is in control, not us. He has a bigger plan than we do. We don't always understand the suffering, nor will we ever. But what we can understand is that there's a problem solver who is already working to solve the solution. I mean, to bring the solution to us, to solve the problem. He's already working. So what do you have to do? Get out of the way and be patient. What can we do as we wait upon the Lord? Quote scripture. Or you can be an angry person going around growling, whining, complaining all the time. You can try to make people afraid of you. I don't know why anybody... Anybody would want their children to fear them. My, my son said to me one time when he was a teenager and we were having an argument and we were going back and forth and he kind of bowed up on his daddy there for a minute and he said, he said, I'm not afraid of you. And man, that hit me like a ton of bricks in, right in the face. He couldn't have done any more harm to me if he'd have hit me right in the face. Because I looked at him and I said, why would I ever, ever, want you to be afraid of me. I want you to be afraid of me. I want you to love me. I don't want him to be afraid. And if I ever brought that on, it was because of my own foolishness. Why would we ever want people we love to be afraid of us? It's not that kind of fear. That's not the kind of fear that God expects out of us. Oh, there is a fear we have for God because we understand he's almighty. He can accomplish all things, but he doesn't want you to be terrified of him. He wants to walk hand in hand with you. He told us that he is our friend. Doesn't want us to be afraid. So why should we ever be Afraid. We should be focused on trying to accomplish God's will. Be patient, understanding that no matter what the circumstance, God's in control and he can help us. But that takes patience. And that's what he's saying here. You can be one of those angry people and you can go through life angry. You can go through life upset. You can go through life complaining and whining. But you know all it does? Ooh, just makes you an old growling dog that nobody trusts or likes. Nobody wants to be around. Well, we can learn to grow in the Lord by being patient, waiting upon the Lord and enduring without complaint. Amen. That's what he wants. That's what we should do. <clears throat> Go into verse number four. Verse number four, he says, the sluggard or the lazy person, okay, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold because it's cold outside and he didn't want to get out in the spring and do the work. He says, therefore, shall he beg in the harvest and have nothing. 
This is the type of person that God does not want us to be. God will not reward lazy people. It doesn't work. That's not scriptural. God does not reward lazy people. We pray for all these blessings when we have a lack of work ethic. We expect our children to go out and work like dogs when they see us sitting on the porch at the house or sitting in a recliner at the house or whatever the problem is. Ain't nothing wrong with sitting in a recliner. I like to kick back mine every once in a while myself. I ain't saying nothing wrong with it. What I'm saying is that when it becomes a lazy thing and it becomes a throne that we sit in to order our subjects around, then it becomes wrong. Okay? This is what we're doing. This is the problem we have. He says, what God expects and what God expects out of a true, faithful person is a hard worker. Somebody who's not afraid to put forth the effort to accomplish things for him. A hard worker who is providing. You know what that means? That if you are a, a hard worker who is providing for his family, then that means that you are making time for your family. You're doing the things necessary to build your family, which is exactly what God expects out of parents what he expects out of all of us as believers is to be hard workers so that we can accomplish his will. Or you can be lazy, and what will you get? Nothing. You know, Paul put it as plain as you could over in his writings when God inspired him to write, if you don't work, you don't eat. You can't get much plainer than that. If you're not going to help provide for yourself, God is not going to continue to provide for you if you're lazy. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you, but God is not a welfare program. All right? That's not the way that he works. You have to put forth effort to receive blessing. And I'm not saying you earn it. That's not at all what I'm saying. You can't work to earn it. All right. What I'm saying is that when you put forth effort, God blesses effort. Amen. God can't bless you if you're not doing it. It won't work that way. God blesses the things that are done, the work that is done, the work that is accomplished. <clears throat> How can you ever be a witness if you never speak about Jesus Christ? How can you ever be a witness if you don't live your life that people can see Christ in you? If they don't know that there's something different about you. Because there's something different. You remember when you get saved by God's grace and you watch new converts like we were talking about and you just sit back and watch them, the first thing you see, the first thing you notice is they're different. They can't help it. They're different. They're brand new. It's completely different for them. And it's completely different with what you see in them. The things that excite them are different. The things that they talk about are different. The things that they want to accomplish are different. Makes a difference when they can see Christ in you. You see, <clears throat> but all of that is done by a hard worker. That's what God blesses. Not that the work in particular is what he's blessing. What he is blessing is that you love him enough to put forth effort. And in that effort, he will bless your work. You see, that's the way he works. That's the way it works. Let's go into verse number five. 
He says, <clears throat> counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. But a man <clears throat> of understanding will draw it out. You know what he's telling us in this verse that God expects us to be? Good listeners. You can go on over into Proverbs 18 and over in the book of Psalms and you can see a lot of the same comparisons talking about a man's mouth is like a deep well. Somebody who has knowledge, somebody who has strength, but the person with great understanding is the one that doesn't just know that it's a deep well, but it's the person who can draw the water out of the well and use it. Amen. That's what he's talking about. So let me put it in a term maybe we can all understand. We think about our children. When our children come to us, and like I say, this doesn't matter about age, and you know for those of you who have grown children, you know I'm not lying. Right. <clears throat> when they come to you, no matter what age they are, you have to be willing to listen. You know what our problems as parents usually is? Well, this is my problem. Maybe not yours. Maybe you're not like this as a parent, but mine is. When my children come to me with a problem, you know what I want to do? I want to tell them how to fix it. Right. This is my problem. It's like, okay, you have this problem. Here's what you need to do. You need to fix it this way. And then they're like, well, no, I don't know. It's like, hey, one day you're going to learn. I tell my children this all the time. I said, one day you're going to learn to listen to your daddy. I don't know when that's going to be. Probably when I'm dead and gone. But one day they're going to listen to something I say. All right? <clears throat> but, but what I'm saying is our ideas as a parent is solve the problem. Our children came to us with a problem, so now we need to solve it. But 95% of the time, they don't need you to solve their problems. They need you to listen. They just need you to listen and hear what they're saying. Because that's what God expects us to do. Listen. Hear what they say. Because a child's heart is not like a spigot or a faucet at your house. Remember, it's like a well. You can turn a spigot on and off. But from a well, you have to put the bucket in, get the water out, bring it out before you can ever use it. So what you have to learn to do is what we want to do is teach our, or tell our children that, listen, right now I don't have time for this or this is what I need you to do. And we try to turn their heart on and off without ever listening to what they're trying to say. It goes the same way with serving God. We treat God more, not more like a deep well of knowledge, that we can draw from and that can, as Jesus Christ said, he could quench our thirst so we would never thirst again. He could give us water, living water, where we would never thirst again. So instead of drawing out of that well of knowledge and well of life, what we want to do with God is treat him like a wishing well. Lord, I'm going to throw this quarter in and I want you to accomplish this, this, and this because the preacher said if I pay my tithes and do what I'm supposed to, then you're going to answer every prayer I ever make. Nope. You can't treat God like a wishing well. It doesn't work that way. God is not a wishing well where we can give a Christmas list to. You have to serve God. One of the greatest Greatest things that we talk about right here, when we talk about this, what are some of the things he taught us? He taught us to be patient. He taught us to work hard. Now what he's teaching us is of great importance. Listen. Listen. 
Hear what God is saying. Hear what God has to say just as we have to listen to our children. We have to hear what they're saying before we can ever, ever try to help fix the problem. But we don't always listen, just like we don't with God. God says, oh, well, I need you to do this. And it's like, okay, here I go. It's like, no, wait. I'm not finished. But we go off before God is finished. We don't always listen. And what God expects out of us as parents is to listen. And what he expects out of us as his children is to listen. Let's look at verse number six. <clears throat> he says, most men, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. He's going to brag on himself. But a faithful man, who can find? Who can find a faithful man? Because most men go around and try to share their ideas of how good they are at all things. Don't get on your nerves when you hear braggarts all the time. Or I say, I am the best at everything I do. It's like, well, I did this. Like, yeah, I did that twice already and was the best ever. I've accomplished that already. I've done this and I've done that. I've been everywhere, done everything, seen everything. You know those people? Mm -hmm. I know way too many of those people. <laughs> this is the type of person that God does not expect us to be. You know, <clears throat> I always go back, every time I think about bragging, I always go back and think about Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, where he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, didn't, didn't, none of that is by you. You're not saved because of you. You're saved by grace through faith, and it is the gift of God. That's a gift of God, not of you. And then he goes on in verse 9, and he says, not of works, nothing you did. He said, why? Lest any man should boast. It means they're going to brag. And I always think about, can you imagine being in heaven with people who brag all the time about how they got there? That's really not heaven, is it? To have to walk down the streets of gold and the place of glory and listen to people talk about, let me tell you what I did to get here. I accomplished all this and I went to this school and I did that and I led this many people to Christ and I did all this and I, 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 and ain't nobody going to spend eternally, eternity listening to a bunch of braggarts, right? So God made it very plain and clear. It doesn't have anything to do with you. You can't brag about it because you didn't accomplish anything. Jesus Christ did. Right? So <clears throat> that's the important part, and so that should remove all bragging from us. When we remember we are poor sinners saved by grace, that you and I are nothing without Jesus Christ, but with Jesus Christ we can do all things. You see, it always puts us back where we're supposed to be. So what does God expect us to be? He expects us to be a faithful friend. Now here's where people misinterpret this for parents. Parents say, I ain't here to be your buddy. I'm here to be your parent. And in cases, absolutely. Because you have one of those parents. Listen, I know this parent who has three little boys. And <clears throat> I don't know that I've seen three more misbehaving, aggravating little boys in my life. And the mom says, I am a gentle parent. I try to be a friend to my child. It's like what you need to do, get up and beat that young dad. Because something they ain't got no manners. All right? <clears throat> get gentleness is going out the window, honey. Now, I mean, one of them one day bowed up and was going to hit his mom. So, you know, I hate it, but a 10-year-old bows up on me, going to eat some teeth, man. No, I ain't going to hit no young man's mouth, but you want to. 
But what I'm saying is this is the type of thing people say, well, I can't be their friend. I'm here to be their parent. Same way with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our friend, but he, we know he's our Savior. You know what that means? You can still listen to your child. You can still pay attention to what they say. You can still be a companion to your child. But the thing that makes you friendly is that you are the spiritual leader of that child. So while you're listening, while you're being patient, while you're working hard to accomplish things in their lives, then you are a faithful friend to them because you are trying to lead them in the right direction. Children don't always understand until you grow up and become parents yourself, but punishments are one of the hardest things in the world for parents to do. Because we don't want to punish. We just want you to be better. Do what you know is right. But there are consequences for things that go wrong. But that doesn't mean that you can't be faithful. It's because you love them that you chastise them. It's because you love them that you correct them. It's because you love them that you lead them in a spiritual direction, which takes us back to the point. If you want to be a faithful, spiritual leader of your children, not somebody who goes around and brag, now I want you to be like your daddy and I want you to do this and accomplish this and accomplish that. It's like, no. The greatest thing you will ever pass on to your children is a legacy of Jesus Christ leading you in your life. That's the greatest thing you'll pass on. So be the spiritual leader that you need to be with a loving, caring heart. Because what do friends do? Friends care about each other. Do you know no matter how bad your child is, even like those three youngins I was talking about that probably need to hide envy? But even with that, do you know that that mom and dad will always love those children no matter what they do? If you have that love, you can't help it. It doesn't matter what your child does. You don't stop loving them. You may not love what they do, but you still love them. So all you can do is be a spiritual leader, a faithful friend. Then the last one, right here, verse number seven. This is a fantastic verse and says so much if we'll just stop and look at it. It says, the just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. You know, there's no greater thing that can be said to you as a parent is that you passed on the legacy of Jesus Christ to your children. Nothing better that you can accomplish in the world than to show them how to live for their Savior. You know, <clears throat> Sean Tay was talking a few minutes ago about <clears throat> Maddie being at Nationals, running track. More proud of Maddie. Thrilled to death for her. And I was thinking she finished third a minute ago and said, so she's going to be All-American in the nation. That's pretty good. But anyway, when we stop and think about it, <clears throat> and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about running track, and it popped in my mind about the 4 by 400 relay, you know, where you run and you run around the track, and then you've got to pass that little baton off to the next person. doesn't matter how fast you run. You can run faster than anybody else. But if you don't pass the baton in the right way, if you don't do it correctly, then it doesn't matter how fast you ran. It doesn't matter how slow you ran. Because if your partner drops that baton, your race is over. It's done. 
So one of the most important things in that race is passing the baton. Works the same way as parents, as spiritual leaders, as living our Christian life on a daily basis. How are you going to pass the baton on someone else? Because it matters how you do it. If you don't do it the right way, then everything else is for nothing. Doesn't matter if you lived your life pretty good. Doesn't matter if you lived your life all right. What matters is the legacy that you pass on. Think about what Jesus Christ has passed on to us. And now he expects that for us to pass that on. You see, what he expects us to do is to be righteous. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. I was talking about righteousness in our Bible study. I don't remember if it was this week, week before, I don't know. But I was talking about righteousness, and I, had, I said I always explain righteousness as one of those things where <clears throat> the way, the simplest way I know how to explain it is there's nothing more than that nothing more simple than just do the right thing. Pretty simple, right? That's all righteousness is, is doing the right thing. But I heard another preacher who defined righteousness as having, and I thought this was maybe, well, not maybe, this is better than mine, I'm not that smart, but, but the way he described it was by having the right standing with God. I thought, man, that's good. Having the right standing with God. Being where we're supposed to be in our relationship with God. That's what he expects out of us. He expects us to have high integrity. He expects us to have great character. Someone who stands on their principles. Someone who lives by the truth of the word of God. That's what he expects. What does God expect out of us? He expects you to be patient. He expects you to work hard. He expects you to listen. He expects us to be faithful. And he expects us to live a righteous life. Life. Now, if we can do that as fathers, then we've accomplished the understanding of being a spiritual leader. If we can do that as believers, man, woman, girl, boy, makes no difference. If we can live that way, then we have accomplished exactly what God intends for us to accomplish in the way that he intends for us to live for him. So, here's the question we have to ask. Is that the way we live? Is that the things we do? That's the question we all have to ask ourselves. If not, now's the time to make a difference. Today's the day to change. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come once again, Lord, by saying thank you for all your Christian dads spread throughout this world who are trying to accomplish your will by being the spiritual leaders that they should, doing the things that they should. God, we are so thankful for all of our Christian parents who are holding forth the word of life, who are teaching their children that Jesus Christ is the one way and the only way that our Savior needs to be lifted up now more than any other. Lord, that our churches need to be lifted up now more than at any other time. That we need to come together with one mind and one accord serving you. Lord, we pray that we will all have this mindset. 
If you find weakness within us in any of these areas, Lord, we pray that you reveal it to us so that we can become stronger and closer to you. Help us, guide us, give us understanding, and let us go out and accomplish your will. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.